Welcome, you're watching the Mutual Fund Show on NDTV Profit and I'm Tamanna Inamdar. This show hopes to bring you advice from the industry experts so you can make the right choices on your mutual fund investment journey. Today, we're starting the show by talking about Crystal's mutual fund rankings for the quarter gone by. We are also going to talk about the difference between index funds and ETFs ahead on the show to tell you which was a better choice and, of course, take a few of your queries. But let's start with part one, where we're focusing on Crystal's quarterly rankings uh, ending with December 2023. Piyush Gupta is joining me now. He is Director of Funds Research at Crystal Market Intelligence and Analytics. Piyush, great to have you on NDTV Profit. Uh, great to speak with you on the show. Let's begin by getting an overview of your rankings. Have there been any big changes you've seen in the quarter gone by? I think you're on mute, Piyush. We can't quite hear you. Piyush? Yeah, hi, Tamanna. Can there you, hear you me? are. There you are. Yeah. Super. Yeah. Yes. Should I repeat the question? We wanted to know if there was any big changes this quarter. Yeah, so there are a uh, few changes in the ranking. Uh, uh, of course, uh, when we look at uh, ranking over a period of time, there are a few consistent performers. Uh, depending on the category, we can look at some of the examples uh, uh, where there have been big changes and we can talk about them. Let's start with flexi caps. Let's start with the flexi cap category. This is uh, one that has been a very popular one in terms of new launches as well from the hmm. AMCs. Um, uh, how have they fared overall? What has been the average return and which are the top performers and the bottom performers? Right. So flexi cap as a category and before I get into the ranking, a quick overview on the criteria or the parameter that we typically uh, look at when we carry out these rankings. So the ranking comprises of uh, one parameter on performance uh, historically measured using a uh, rolling return. Second uh, being the volatility which is used, uh, which is measured using standard deviation as a parameter. Then we look at uh, three portfolio based parameters, which is uh, diversification of portfolio at a sectoral level, company level, and third being the liquidity of the underlying portfolio. So all of these factors are looked together uh, before we arrive at the final rank. And funds who fare well in most of these parameters uh, tend to come on top. And given that we look at, uh, we are looking at equity funds here, uh, there is a higher weight which is given to the past performance, and hence they tend to play a major role when it comes to the final ranking. Mm. Now, uh, flexi cap as a category, I think it's a, one of the largest uh, category within the uh, equity mutual fund space. Uh, the inflows have been positive consistently for this particular category. When we look at the uh, the ranking of funds within this category, what we have seen is Bank Bank of India FlexiCap, JM FlexiCap, and HGFC FlexiCap are the top ranked funds uh, for the quarter ending December. Uh, Bank of India and JM are rank one, and HGFC FlexiCap is rank two. The uh, the bottom ranked funds are Motilal Oswal, UTI FlexiCap, and Axis FlexiCap. These funds are ranked uh, either five or four in the flexi cap category. Okay. Um, what are the key drivers and rankings, say, in your mid cap and small cap uh, category, Piyush? Right. So, in case of uh, mid cap category, uh, again, if you were to look at the rankings, uh, the top performers are Nippon, HDFC, and Mahindra, uh, while the bottom performers are UTI, Access, and PGIM. Uh, specifically, when you look at uh, the top performer, we have seen that uh, Nippon has been consistently in the top rank category over a period of time. The fund is ranked either one or two in the last five quarters. Same is the case with HDFC mid-cap uh, opportunities. Mahindra has uh, seen an improvement in ranking in the last couple of quarters, and it is now getting ranked two uh, in the latest quarter. In case of uh, bottom rank funds, uh, Funds like UTI, Axis, and PGM, they have uh, been in the bottom rank for uh, most of the last five quarters we have seen. If you look at Axis, the fund has remained either four or five in the last five quarters. PGM, in fact, has seen a decline in the ranking. 
it used to be ranked to uh, more than one year back now it has gradually come down to uh, three and eventually is now ranked five in the latest quarter so uh, if you yeah go ahead no so so go ahead i was talking for example for an axis uh, while you're right they're at number 5 in your ranking one of the parameters as you explained in your opening comments is is volatility so for investors who are watching this and um, are looking at a 1 2 3 4 5 sort of ranking uh, to what extent is it important to take that into concern as well because in your overall weightage i think volatility of the fund accounts for 25% doesn't it yes yes so uh, uh, in terms of the parameter weightage uh, performance of course has a weight of 50% volatility has a weight of 25% and then remaining uh, uh, weights are uh, assigned to the concentration and liquidity parameter uh, when we look at the ranking outputs especially in the equity category what we find is uh, performance becomes a key driver uh, for the final ranking eventually and when we look at access specifically uh, 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 as an example, what we've seen is the fund is ranked five in the uh, return parameter. And to that extent, that uh, has a major contribution when it comes to the final outcome of the ranking. The volatility, of course, uh, for the access mid-cap fund is lower compared to the other, uh, uh, other funds within the category, but it's the performance where the fund has actually underperformed the benchmark as well as the category over a long period of time. On top of it, the fund also uh, has a concentrated portfolio uh, and which is where on a concentration parameter, the fund ranks lower, especially on the company uh, diversification at a company level. Further, the fund size is uh, close to 23,000 crore, which also hampers the underlying liquidity of the portfolio. Let's talk a bit about small cap funds and what their ranking has shown you. This has again been a volatile space, but a high return space. Have you seen consistency here in the rankings? Yes. So when I look at small cap as a category, Nippon, Franklin and Quant small cap are the top ranked funds. Nippon is ranked one, Franklin is ranked one and Quant is ranked two. Uh, when I look at the historical ranking for, say, Nippon, Nippon is, in fact, ranked one in the last four consecutive quarters. Uh, and even before that, the, the fund was ranked two. Uh, when we look at Franklin Templeton, the fund has been ranked one in the last two quarters. And before that, uh, I mean, in the previous two quarters, the fund was ranked two. So to that extent, Nippon and Franklin has been consistent uh, in the ranking in the last uh, five quarters. Quant small cap ha used to be rank one. Uh, even then, in the one of the quarters, it moved to rank three, and now currently it is rank two. So um, this is a important sort of ranking to track. In the simple reason to actually see where your funds are going. Having said that, it's not an absolute thing that if a fund's ranking falls one quarter, then you should jettison it completely. Take a more um, wholesome or holistic view on what to do with your funds. Nevertheless, all information is welcome when it comes to picking the right funds. Thank you so much, Piyush, uh, for joining us today. Piyush Gupta of Crystal there on their quarterly ranking. We're taking a very short break, but don't go anywhere because on the other side, we're taking your questions. We're also talking about whether you should go in for an index fund or an ETF, which could work better for you.
Welcome back. You're watching the Mutual Fund Show. We're talking in this segment about index funds and comparing them as an option to ETFs. Mohit Ganga, co-founder and CEO of Moneyfront, is joining me on this. I'm also speaking with Amol Joshi. He is founder of Plan Rupee Investment Services. Mohit, Amol, welcome. Great to speak with you. Mohit, let me begin first uh, with you know your basic take of why index funds are preferred perhaps more by retail investors and how would you compare the two? Hi, Tamanna. Always a pleasure to be on your show. Uh, so look, I think index funds as an option are fairly easy to be done by retail investors. To, to be doing an ETF, uh, obviously you need to have a DMAT account. You need to also have a broking account through a broker. You you will have to execute your transactions or perhaps you will do it through an online platform, uh, right? Uh, in index funds, the good part is the liquidity and the pricing is guaranteed by the fund house. So for a retail investor, it becomes fairly easy and convenient to enter and exit an index fund. You can enter via an SIP route, which again is not possible when you're buying ETFs unless your broker specifically provides you that facility. In terms of liquidity also, at the closing day price, which is the NAV, which is declared by the fund house, a retail investor can any day exit an index fund. To exit an ETF, you will have to execute a transaction on the exchange. And sometimes because of the liquidity issues, the bid ask spread can be fairly wide when you are trying to sell an ETF. But through an index fund, you're always guaranteed an exit by the fund house. So to my mind, honestly, uh, if you keep aside the factor of cost, uh, I think an index fund is always more advisable. If you are entering through an SIP route or if you are trying to uh, uh, do smaller amounts gradually and build up your purpose, an index fund uh, for retail investors is the most advisable and preferred route. Okay, so index fund is preferable for retail investors, but Amol Joshi, the counter argument could be that it costs less. Your transactional costs are less um, in an ETF. You don't have to give the fund any fees. Why not go in for an ETF, uh, which also you can settle quicker and gives you the advantage of movement through the day? Right. Tamanda, absolutely. This is a fair point. Uh, let's break the answer into two parts. Uh, part number one is about the cost. So if I take the largest fund house, SBI, they also have the largest ETF because of EPFO investments and their own nifty index fund. The difference is about 25 times. ETF is 25 to 30 times bigger in AUM than the index fund. But the cost differential is not more than 15 to 17 pesa or 15 to 17 basis points. So in other words, if ETF delivers all things, all other things remaining constant, if ETF delivers 12% return for you, this fund will deliver 15 basis points less. That is 11 point about 85%. That's not much of a difference, I would say. Uh, and the convenience aspect of, uh, as my co-panelist al already mentioned, that you will not be able to execute SIP seamlessly in ETF. And most of the retail investors, as we have been seeing for last several years, prefer the SIP route to enter into equity. That's about the cost part. It's not very significant. There is also the thing about bid and ask spreads. Uh, ETF gets INAV declared at every, uh, you know, uh, uh, live in the market, but you'll hardly find liquidity for buy sell transactions in ETF at the same price. So that takes care of the cost aspect. And second aspect um, uh, is about, uh, you mentioned intraday liquidity. So intraday liquidity is fine, but we should understand that most of the ETFs or commonly we will talk about are equity funds. And equity, as we all know, and your channel also has said this many times, is a long-term investment asset class. So I, in my opinion, it does not really matter if you are investing for a three or five year horizon and you end up making purchase on Monday, end of the day in AV via index fund, or Monday, let's say 11.15 a.m. via ETF. It does not really matter. It is a long-term asset class. If you are going to stay three to five years, intraday liquidity should be least of your concerns. Hmm. That's fair enough. Uh, having said that, between the two, Mohit, you are very clear that for retail investors, um, index funds are a better option. What is the scenario or what is the base case for an ETF, if at all? And which in these two categories do you like specifically, index funds and ETFs? If someone were looking uh, you know, to start off in both categories, what would you suggest? Okay, uh, look, so, Tamanna, so the case for ETFs is also uh, also fairly strong. Uh, for very, very extremely savvy uh, ultra h &I investors, uh, look, an ETF gives you a benefit that when you are transacting on an exchange, the costs incurred in that transaction are borne only by the person who is executing the transaction. 
unlike in fund what happens is if a fund buys and sells any stock the cost of that transaction is borne by the entire set of investors who are invested via that fund so etf solely appropriates the cost to the person who executes the transaction which gives etf an inherent advantage that the taxes and the costs are not borne by the entire set of investors who are sitting patiently and uh, and just holding the fund for uh, long term second is that intraday case for traders uh, who would want to trade on indices uh, basically i think etf gives a great opportunity to enter at a particular price point and exit at a particular price point but as my colleague amol rightly said that it's not very easy to time the markets and for people who are investing for long term perhaps that's not the right way of doing it yet i understand that there might be a trading class who wants to make good of the intraday price movements and that's where uh, the thing comes into play and the third and the last category of investors who might want to consider etf is the investors who are extremely extremely cost conscious uh, etfs will uh, definitely give you that 2 3 5 bips uh, added advantage on the cost even if you account for the transaction cost the broking cost the stts and other things which are involved in an etf trade uh, they will give you slight bit of advantage over the index funds uh, but i think that is negated by the convenience part and other parts which an index fund provides for me the call is very clear i would always prefer an index fund but for an extremely savvy investor who wants to make good of the intraday prices i think an etf might be a preferred choice and and your uh, preferred uh, or your most recommended etfs and uh, index funds mohit let me start with you uh look uh, for a fairly long while we have been strong proponents on the large cap side to only go in the passive style of investing so out there a nifty 50 index fund from a pro icici fund house or pantan nifty 50 index fund are our preferred uh, uh, index funds out there uh, on the mid cap side uh, we like the factor based uh, indices a little more so the uti momentum 30 and the dsp quality 50 are two uh, preferred indices again uh out there uh, so those are my preferred choices amol very quickly do you want to tell us your uh, preferred choices or uh, one for etf one for an index fund certainly uh, in large cap space nothing beats sbi nifty etf it has the largest aum and it is uh, you know it it just tracks the index so you go with the lowest cost that's sbi uh, etf for you and for index fund you can look at probably um, uti nifty 50 index fund okay Okay all right so those are your options for index funds or ETF and uh, now uh, one of my favorite parts of the show which is where we take your queries so let's start with this question that Noel has sent us he is uh, 22 years of age he says his current investments are uh, 3000 rupees every month and he puts it each in the following funds and he's been doing it since the last 18 months good for you Noel uh, excellent discipline quant small cap fund quant momentum fund um the hdfc mid cap opportunities fund and the parag parik flexi cap fund so and the sbi contra fund so so some very good choices there now here's the query i'm planning to move from the hdfc mid cap opportunities fund to either quant mid cap fund or the edelweiss nifty mid cap 150 momentum fund due to their growing aum so i want to compare these two with the hdfc mid cap opportunities fund all right let's get uh, amul to fill this first i tavanna so uh, uh, based on the details that noel has shared with us uh, so you are noel you are right there is significant gap between aum asset under management of hdfc mid cap fund compared to quant mid cap fund but at the same time if you look at their two year and 10 year performance hdfc mid cap has done better and over a 3 year and 5 year quant has done better so i would say that aum uh, so let's address this uh, um, elephant in the room aum so far has not been the detrimental factor uh, uh, you know even if uh, there we have funds uh, that have tens of thousands of crores some of the schemes are 50 to 70000 crore in large cap space or even hybrid space so aum is not really the constraint in one line you can just remember always remember as the fund aum has grown so has the market cap or the entire market cap of the listed universe that's point number 1 point number 2 you want to compare these three schemes i would say um, quant mid cap and hdfc mid cap it's slightly a fair comparison but that is not the case if you compare a momentum as uh, you know it's a factor based it it is not exactly in the same category so i uh, this fund also does not have a track record if you are purely comparing based on performance which you should not do but if you are then you will you will not find a performance history for the momentum fund 
Coming back to choosing between HDFC mid-cap and Quant mid-cap, uh, Quant scores better on the price-to-book, price-to-earning, which are valuation uh, parameters in a fine, but at the same time, it has a very high churn rate. So if you are fine with higher AUM size, I would suggest you stick with your existing set of funds, review them annually, and only if you find a cause for concern based on performance compared to the peer group or benchmark, only then there is a need to shift. Otherwise, if you want to shift to a momentum fund, then probably you can look at Edelweiss Momentum Fund uh, mid-cap 150. But All otherwise, right. you can stay put with the HDFC mid-cap. All right, so stay with HDFC for one. An important point that AUM may not be the right parameter. Another question from Abdul Mujib Kazi. He says he's done a lump sum investment of uh, 5 lakh rupees each in two small cap funds, one manufacturing fund and one mid cap fund. His query is, I'm looking to diversify into sectoral or thematic funds and close one of my small cap funds. Please suggest those other than SMID and small caps for a horizon of five to eight. I'm going to uh, take this question to Mohit. Uh, with the point about why sectoral or thematic funds have been so popular and should you close out a small cap fund to move to one of these? Uh, okay, uh, look, Tamanna, I think this is this is a fad which has been in vogue for the last two years now. I think there's a lot of temptation going out there or perhaps the FOMO factor that people really want to be in small caps, mid caps and sectoral funds. Uh, look, my suggestion to Mr. Kazi is, uh, uh, is that sectoral funds are extremely difficult to track. You might perhaps make an entry into one or two sectoral funds, but you will inevitably get it wrong when to get out of those sectoral funds. The sectoral cycles rotate and change extremely fast. Uh, right. So perhaps you might fancy a PSU cycle, but just to give you some perspective, uh, last year PSU PAC gave 23% return and prior to that it gave 79% return. But if you track a full 10 year period of PSU performance from 2016 to 2019, there were consistently four years when they gave huge negative returns. And in the back of full 10 years, there have been over six years uh, when the PSU pack has given negative returns. So sometimes things which look quite fancy because of a momentum play in the market might not be the right thing. My suggestion is that you continue with your small cap and mid cap allocations, continue building them through your SIP or STP vehicles. But instead of going for a sectoral fund, I would rather suggest that you go in for a large cap fund in your portfolio. Your portfolio currently doesn't have a large cap fund. And my suggestion will be to go into a passive uh, large cap index fund out there. You can choose between a Pru ICSN Nifty 50 index fund or a Bandhan Nifty 50 index fund. Uh, but I think uh, every portfolio should have a good concoction of large cap, mid cap and small cap and perhaps one small tactical pay, which could be an international fund or a commodity fund or something like that. Right. But it is absolutely essential to have large, mid and small in, in good proportion. Well, like a well-balanced meal, you need to have a well-balanced portfolio. Thank you so much, Amul and Mohit, for joining us on the show uh, today. That's all the time we have. But remember, do send in your queries so we can take them up on this show every day at 1.30, Monday to Friday. Thank you for watching.
Hello and welcome. You're watching Earnings Edge here on NDTV Profit. And the first company that we are going to be talking to is Borisal Renewables. Uh, well, uh, it's been a couple of challenging quarters, largely because of dumping. And we're going to talk about that, the implications on the company, as well as uh, what we can expect going forward. And for that, we have with us uh, Mr. Pradeep Kumar Keruka. He's the chairman of Borisal Renewables. Uh, Mr. Keruka, good afternoon. Thanks for joining in. Uh, we know that the company has had, uh, you know, to go through uh, the implications of dumping, which, because of which we've had a severe erosion in your EBITDA, and thereby leading to a bottom line loss coming through. Uh, can you tell us about whether or not there is light at the, uh, the end of the tunnel, and when can we, in fact, expect the company to go back into the black? Considering the current conditions, I believe that there are two aspects to it. Besides uh, the, you know, the lower prices, uh, we are also looking at uh, well, increased interest costs as well. Can you take us through some of these challenges at the moment? Sure. Thank you. So uh, the fact is that uh, the, the exemptions from payment of import duty on solar glass were to have come to an end. Uh, on the 31st of March, 2023. The government in its wisdom decided to extend it by a year, last year, and uh, these were now set to come to an end on the 31st of March, 2024. For the whole year, we have been petitioning the government, showing them that there is a lot of dumping going on, that the prices of solar glass being imported from China have suffered a steep decline, while the prices of inputs, the commodities that are used uh, to manufacture the glass have actually registered a sharp rise. So this is paradoxical where the cost of inputs is rising and the price of uh, sales is declining. It's clearly a, a predatory move uh, designed